Hello, welcome back to the Sam Ellis Academy. Today, it's bonding. More specifically, the first of three videos in the bonding topic. In this one, we're dealing with the three distinctions of bonding, ionic, covalent, and metallic, and then we're comparing them three against each other. So let's begin with ionic bonding. Before we do that though, let's quickly refresh our minds on what an ion actually is. An ion's an atom or a molecule with a net overall charge. This is due to the loss or the gain of one or more electrons, depending on which element or molecule we're talking about. We can have more electrons than protons or less electrons electrons than protons to make negative and positive ions respectively. For example, sodium loses one electron to get the eight valence electrons or eight outer electrons. Chlorine in its atomic state has got seven outer electrons as you can see, so it gains an electron to form a chloride ion. A slightly different example, we take magnesium. Originally, there's two outer electrons, so in order to get the noble or full outer energy level structure, it's going to be far easier for magnesium to lose two electrons rather than gain six, so it forms Mg2+. You don't have to just remember what ions different elements form. In fact, if you look at the table, at least for a vast majority of the main group elements, it's actually very obvious. All of group one looks like this. All of them have got one outer electron, so they're all going to lose one outer electron to form a one plus ion. If we look at group seven, on the other hand, you can see there's seven outer electrons so obviously they're going to gain one to get the full eight if we look at group two all of them have got two outer electrons so they're all going to lose two to form a two plus ion now although you can use the best invention in all of human history to identify ions formed from atoms there's a few compound ions you need to well learn it may be useful to copy this table out and put it on an anki flashcard you need to know the ammonium ion is one plus charged carbonate ion is two minus charged a hydroxide ion is one minus charged a nitrate is one minus and a sulfate is two minus charged. Okay, now we're actually going to get on to ionic bonding and talk about what's going on in an ionic compound. Electrostatic attraction, which simply means the attraction between positive and negative things. That is what's going on inside an ionic compound. You get an ionic compound when you react two things, for example, sodium and chlorine, and they react and form a positive and negative ion. Sodium loses an electron, chlorine gains one, and you've got a positive and negative ion. That creates a electrostatic force of attraction, and it holds positive and negative ions together in a very strong ionic bond. Ionic compounds have structures known as giant ionic lattices. They look like this. A giant ionic lattice, like the one you can see here, which is sodium chloride, is just a fancy way of saying it's the same base units repeating over and over again. It's a load of sodium and chloride ions repeating over and over. Sodium chloride is a very common example of an ionic compound, but let's look at something a little bit different. Magnesium chloride is slightly different because it's not a group one and seven pair in the sense it's not a plus one and a minus one ion after they've reacted. Magnesium is going to form a two plus ion and the chloride ion that you would form is one minus. That means you're going to need two chloride ions for every magnesium ion. Something to learn though, which is intuitive to be honest with you, is if you have a compound like sodium chloride, which is a group one and group seven pair, so it's a plus one and minus one ion pair, and you can pair the strength of the bonds in it with something like magnesium oxide, which is a two plus and two minus pair, you'll find that magnesium oxide is melting point, and therefore the bonds between the two ions is much stronger. That's because you've got a two plus and two minus ion pair rather than a one plus and one minus pair. Another situation you could have is an ionic compound like magnesium nitrate. Now, a nitrate compound ion like we just learned has got a one minus charge and magnesium as it was just a second ago is still a two plus ion now that isn't a problem in itself there's obviously just going to be two nitrate ions to every one magnesium ion but the problem arises when you need to write it down and it's actually not a big problem at all you just write it like this you put the nitrate in brackets and put a two as a subscript all right now we've got a grasp of how an ionic bond forms we need to now pay attention to their behavior you need to know about three properties electrical conductivity melting point and solubility in terms of electrical conductivity ionic compounds can not conduct electricity unless they're molten or dissolved in something. If the ions are in a liquid state, they're free to move. And as you know, electricity is just the movement of charged particles. When they're solid, they're stuck in place. The charged particles can't move and there is therefore no current. In terms of melting point, it's high. Why though? Well, the bonds are very strong. To melt something, you need to overcome the bonds. So melting points are going to be high. 800 degrees Celsius for sodium chloride. And as a matter of fact, if you think about what I just told you about the two plus and two minus combo that magnesium oxide has got going on, you'd expect a much higher melting point. And you'd be very pleased to know that it is 2,852 degrees Celsius. Okay, finally, solubility. Ionic compounds do tend to dissolve in water. This is because water is a polar molecule. If you've learned that in your lessons, you might know what I'm on about. But if not, we get more into that in the next video. But for now, learn the fact. Ionic compounds tend to dissolve in water. 
All right, so that's ionic bonding out of the way. We're now gonna move on to covalent bonding, which is probably the most important type of bonding and the most common type of bonding in the world and the universe. First though, we need to clarify the meaning of a word, molecule. Most of you will already know this, but a molecule is when you've got two or more atoms bonded together, Cl2, H2O, both molecules. All right, so covalent bonds, you might remember this from GCSE, but they're shared pairs of electrons. If we take iodine, seven electrons on its outer shell, and we get another iodine atom with another seven electrons, if they share one of these pairs, as you can see, both of them are happy. They've both got eight electrons on the outer shell. This representation you can see is a dot cross diagram or a Lewis structure named after the man who came up with the covalent bond back in the day. But another way you'll be very used to seeing covalent bonds drawn by the time you finish year 12 is with a straight line. One straight line represents one covalent bond, two straight lines represents two covalent bonds, and three, which is the most you'll see at A level, represents a triple bond. Carbon dioxide, as you can see here, looks like this as a Lewis structure. And then if we use the lines to represent the covalent bonds, which you will do most most often, it looks like this. Right, so that's all well and good. Covalent bond is a shared pair of electrons. Sometimes it's two pairs, sometimes it's three pairs. What more do they want you to know? Well, I'm glad you asked. There's two types of covalent structures that we need to know about. Both of these are covalent, but you need to understand the important distinctions. The two distinctions are simple covalent structures and giant covalent structures, or molecular and macromolecular structures. Simple covalent and molecular and giant covalent and macromolecular are interchangeable. First, let's look at a simple covalent compound. This is where the atoms themselves are held together by strong covalent bonds, like in iodine. But the intermolecular forces, there's more on this in the next video, but the forces between the molecules are weak. This means simple covalent molecules can be a gas or a liquid. Think about iodine and chlorine. Both of them are simple covalent molecules. Both of them are gases. The second distinction is giant covalent structures. This is where you've got a huge network of covalently bonded atoms together. There are two examples that AQA going to want you to know. You'll probably recall this from GCSE and it's diamond and graphite. We need to dive a bit further into the difference between diamond and graphite. Both of them are carbon covalent structures, but as you can see in graphite, every carbon atom is bonded to three other carbon atoms. That means there's one missing bond, if you will, because carbon can form four covalent bonds normally. So we have two things that occur because of this missing bond. The layers in graphite can slide over each other because the intermolecular forces between the layers themselves are actually weak. Not the covalent bonds, but the forces between the layers. As I just said a second ago, there's not four bonds, which means there's a spare electron on every carbon atom. And that means graphite can conduct electricity. On top of these two properties, there's two more you need to know that aren't to do with that missing bond. Despite the weak intermolecular forces, the strong covalent bonds mean there's a high melting point, about 3,500 degrees, and you can't dissolve it because to dissolve it, you need to break the covalent bonds. All right, now let's move on to diamond. Like graphite, but instead of three bonds, every carbon's got four. Diamond's got an even higher melting point. It's very, very hard, and it cannot conduct electricity. The reason for this being the fact that there is four bonds, not the three, so there's no longer the spare electron like there was in graphite. You can't dissolve diamond in any solvent. No matter how hard you try, it will never dissolve. Okay, that's everything you need to know about covalent and ionic bonding. Not too much. But there's a question that always tugged my mind when I was learning this for the first time, and that is, why aren't covalent things just ionic? If you think about it, for iodine to be happy, it needs to gain another electron. Why is it not just stealing that off another iodine atom? Which is what chlorine does when it reacts with sodium to form sodium chloride. And that's all down to a new concept at A level called electronegativity. Electronegativity is officially defined as the power of an atom to attract an electron pair in a covalent bond. But a good way to think about it is really just how much does a certain atom like electrons? If we look on the table, the most electronegative atom is fluorine. The closer you get to fluorine, the more electronegative the atom is. At A level, you're not really told further than that. You're expected to remember the definition and you're expected to use it to understand polarity, which we'll get onto in the next video. But every element on the table is assigned an electronegativity value. Now, how we get that number isn't important, but if there's a difference in electronegativity of about 1.7, so every single group one element when it reacts with a group seven element has a difference of more than 1.7, you get an ionic bond. If it's between 0.5 and 1.7, you end up with a covalent bond. If we have carbon and oxygen, for example, which we know forms a covalent carbon dioxide molecule, carbon doesn't hate electrons enough to give them away to oxygen, and oxygen doesn't love electrons enough to rob them from carbon. Unlike in sodium and chlorine when they react, chlorine really likes electrons, and so Sodium hates them because its electronegativity is so low relative to chlorines being so high. But bear in mind, you do not need to know that and you don't need to remember the number that I've just said of 1.7. But it's a good explainer that I wish I had when I was learning this. So now that we've dealt with ionic and covalent, the last type of bonding that stands alone is metallic. As the name implies, metallic bonding is just in metals, all of the transition metals, and obviously all of group one and two as well. 
the alkali metals. These metals exist as giant metallic lattice structures. They look a bit like this. And as you may have remembered from GCSE, the electrons are free to move around. So you call it a delocalized sea of electrons. The electrons can move freely, which makes them good electrical conductors, but the delocalized electrons can also pass kinetic energy to each other, and that makes them good thermal conductors. Metals tend to have very high melting points as well, in general. Obviously, mercury is a liquid at room temperature, but other than that, every single one of them is a solid at room temperature. The number of delocalized electrons per atom will affect the melting point. The more of them there are, the stronger the bond will be. Similar to the ionic situation when we had MgO, which was a 2 plus magnesium ion and a 2 minus oxygen ion. If you have, well, let's just say magnesium, which is 2 plus, that means for every magnesium atom, there's two electrons in the delocalized C. So the melting point is bound to be higher than something like sodium, which has only got one. Metals are also malleable, and this means that you can whack them with a hammer and change the shape. Paired with this, they're ductile. That means that you can be drawn into a wire. Let's think about copper, for example. That's how all electricity is carried throughout your house. Okay, right, so we've been through the three types of bonding and everything you need to know about them. Now what we're going to do is pretty much the most important part of this video. We're going to compare all of them in a nice table with everything you need to know. Take the facts in the table that will be completed by the end of this video and you will be absolutely fine for any question that AQA asks. Okay, so you can see we've got the four types of bonding, ionic, macromolecular, molecular, and metallic, obviously the two in the middle being covalent. The first row we're going to fill out is the bond is between. And by this, I mean that ionic is going to be between metals and non-metals because of the large difference in electronegativity as we've just discussed. Covalent are always going to be between non-metal things, carbon, oxygen, the halogens. Metallic bonds are between metals, as the name implies. This column that says the bond is, an ionic bond is the electrostatic attraction between positive and negative ions. Covalent is the shared pair of electrons. And metallic is the attraction between the delocalized sea of electrons and the positive ions. Examples and what they look like we've been through, but we're gonna do it again. Sodium chloride's the classic one for ionic. It looks like this, a regular lattice, positive and negative interchanging. For macromolecular, we got diamond and graphite. For simple covalent, we got iodine. And for metallic, magnesium, any metal works. Remember for graphite that there's weak intermolecular forces and therefore the layers can slide. Remember for iodine, there is weak intermolecular forces between the molecules and therefore the melting point and boiling point is quite low. In terms of properties, ionic lattices, we got high melting point because of the strong attraction between the oppositely charged ions. You need a lot of energy to overcome that and therefore a lot of heat. They can conduct electricity when they're molten or in solution, but they can't when they're solid because the ions are fixed in place. Macromolecular things have got high melting points because you need to overcome the strong covalent bonds. That requires a lot of energy. As I said a second ago though, graphite is slippery because of the weak intermolecular forces between the layers. It can of course conduct electricity as well. Simple covalent molecules like chlorine, iodine, they've got lower boiling points because the boiling point is to do with the intermolecular forces, not the covalent bonds. Finally, the properties of metals, high melting points, strong attraction between the electrons and the positive ions. It takes a lot of energy to break it. They're malleable and ductile, so they can be shaped and stretched into wires. And just like that, you've hacked every single property and everything you need to know about the three types of bonding. One little thing I do need to add though is about the dative covalent bond. It doesn't really fit nicely into the rest of the video and it's kind of standalone. A dative covalent bond Bond is when one atom donates both the electrons in a covalent bond. An example is the best way to do it. If we take ammonia, which is NH3, there is a lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen. If a H plus ion comes by in the form of an acid or whatever it may be, the nitrogen will donate both of the electrons to form a covalent bond. In normal covalent bonding, the responsibility is shared between both of the atoms in question, not in a dative bond. Both the electrons come from one of the species. The key point is both the electrons have came from the lone pair on the nitrogen to form the covalent bond with the hydrogen ion. Also note, a dative covalent bond is denoted with this arrow. All right, so that's going to do it for part one of bonding. The next couple of videos are going to deal with shapes of molecules and intermolecular forces, so stay tuned for that. Nice one for watching as always. I've been Sam Ellis from the Sam Ellis Academy. Academy, and I'll see you in the next video.